Going back to over a decade now, the Monsters Centre has on occasion uh, been able to afford to uh, establish writers of residence. And uh, through those initiatives and through other fortunate happenings, I've seen writers come from outside Cork, settled in Cork, and provide an example of the standard of excellence that is uh, encouraged and goaded Cork writers into. Um, writing better than they were up to that point, seeing how there is an editorial bar to aim for, and, 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 and a level of artistic excellence to aim for. <coughs> so, one uh, uh, gave me the idea about five years ago to establish the Frank O'Connor Fellowship, which is generously sponsored by Cork City Council. And that involves bringing uh, a writer of, of major international repute. Uh, to come and live in Ireland for three, to come into Cork for three months, to tutor and mentor uh, emerging Cork writers, to contribute to the creative writing department in UCC, to contribute to readings uh, such as um, this festival and other occasions in the city. Um, our fourth Frank Connor fellow is the uh, Sarah Maitland. Who's published so many books with <laughs> wonderful publishers? Among our publishers are Brago Press, and her current publisher is Comic Press, a press uh, in England which does wonderful work in, in the area of short story, and uh, who's the publisher of at least three of the writers who are all participating in this festival. And uh, Sarah has a, we're, we're very lucky to have a, a story, a new story from Sarah in the current issue. So. Thank you, Pat. That's very sweet. Um, I'm slightly undeserved, but boy, it's nice to be here. <laughs> I should stop worrying about deserving. Um, I just enjoy myself. Um, I think you're in a lovely town, or maybe it's a city, I don't know. Um, I think it has only rained half the days I've been here, <laughs> which I'm told is a rare treat. Um, and I've already it's a very interesting and I'm very proud to be here. Um, I've got a little problem with reading this story um, in the sense it is definitely a print story because it's told in two completely separate voices, which is very easy to mark on the page because one of the stories is in italics and the other is in Roman script. So that if you're reading it, you know exactly what you're getting. But it's a bit hard to read aloud. Um, but I'm going to give it a go called In the Red Bread Oven. I shall take my glasses. For the first few weeks after the test, after she knew for certain, after she got used to knowing, she felt sleek and feline, smug. She stretched and dozed and prowled like a cat. She felt creamy, as though her hip sockets were full of whipped cream as though each of the tiny joints that held her back ribs to her spine were soaked in oil, in extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin? She asked herself, how virgin can you be? Very virgin, more virgin, supercalifragilisticexpialy virgin, not a chance. Her hands fluttered, caressing the skin below her navel, the cat had got the cream. She smiled secretly, not at all virgin to tell the happy truth, pregnant. Once upon a time there was a beautiful queen. She lived in a white palace and wore a gold crown. She was tall and slim and lovely and all the people said, how lucky we are, how fortunate we are to have such a beautiful princess. It was her secret, hugged in the night, hidden in the light. She loved her body, which had given her the secret, a secret worth keeping, her very own, sleek, smooth, contented, alone, like a cat, purring, head swaying, undulating, coiled, sleek, creamy, secret, feline, smug. <coughs> 
spilled for and for glimpsed of her own cleverness, creativity, power. But if they had known the truth, the people would not have thought how lucky we are, because the Queen was really a wicked witch. And inside all that white and gold, she had a cold and selfish heart, and although she liked it when all the people loved her, she never loved them. And then pop, suddenly the bubble burst. You know, Anna, you're putting on weight, Stella said, only a little complacently. Just, Anna thought, rather more complacently, and looked down and saw the ugly cross wrinkle below her waist where her skirt was too tight. She felt a shudder of revulsion. She was not fat, she was never fat, she was never, ever, ever fat, she... She looked up irritated and saw the knowing looks and soppy smiles. Her secret was out and no one seemed overly impressed. Suddenly, she was 38 years old, single and pregnant. Their eyes all said she had got her comeuppance. The oil drained out of her joints, the cream curdled and turned sour. She felt the baby move deep inside her, fluttering with laughter, laughing at her. During the daytime, the beautiful queen looked like a beautiful queen and danced and sang like a good queen should. But at night she was, at night she went out secretly, out of the white palace and into the black forest and she ran with the wild beasts. Later, Colin stopped by her desk. She kept her head down, uh, forcing her eyes across the surface of a sheet of paper. He put his hands on the table, leant over, quiet, intimate. Is it mine? he asked. No, she said, no, it's mine. She owed him more, but she did not want to pay. It isn't yours. She looked up then and he was not laughing. He was looking concerned, curious, not angry, almost, almost greedy. He wanted to share her baby. Well, he couldn't. I'm not due to the middle of October, Colin. Tant. Just tant. It is not yours. She got up and walked away, trying to look elegant and contemptuous and feeling only fury. He hadn't loved her, but he would love to love her baby. She hadn't loved him, actually, but that was not the point. <laughs> A few days later, she overheard them in the ladies' loo, the coffee trash, her colleagues. And they weren't saying, poor Anna, which would have been bad enough. They were saying, poor Brad. After the lunch break, Hazel came up to her and offered her an illustrated brochure. She assumed it was work, took it, glanced down, and it was a knitting pattern. Little jerseys, cardigans, things called matinee jackets. They were pretty, and she could see that they would be a lot of work. Did she want the one with the buttons, or this one? What? she asked. I thought I'd make something for the baby, Hazel said. Hazel, who'd been too busy to help Anna with a rush job only ten days ago. Sometimes, on the darkest nights, the Queen went down the narrow winding paths in the forest, looking for poisonous herbs and noxious berries and the toadstools of midnight, which turn out their ruffled edges and glow with a deadly green cream light. Then she did not feel like a cat purring. <coughs> she felt like a prisoner, a victim. Everyone was on the side of her torturer. Even her own mother, who grinned inanely, patted Anna's stomach in a way that seemed both intrusive and impersonal, said she had always so longed to be a grandmother and made an appointment with her solicitor to change her will. How's my baby, she would ask on the phone. Queen would gather the wicked things into her basket and carry them back to her to, sorry, and carry them back to a little room, high up in one of the towers of the palace. She must use them to mix potent poisons in her black iron cauldron and have evil food in her real bread in her red bread oven. 
Well, it wasn't her. Her body, her home, her life had been invaded by a stranger, a mean, attention-seeking alien. Instead of sympathy or admiration, instead of lavishing themselves on her, instead of and envy and cosseting her, everyone seemed to be in love with this illegal immigrant. The few people who did not fall in love with the baby appeared to think that Anna had been not clever, not beautiful, not creative, but simply stupid. <laughs> and everyone, whichever side they were on, seemed to think that they had the right to tell her what to think, what to feel, and who to be. The baby was the meanest of all. The baby did not sympathise, admire, lavish, envy or cosset. It was not grateful, affectionate, generous or loving. It demanded and it took. It told her in no uncertain terms what she was allowed to do, what she was supposed to feel and who she was meant to be. Not herself anymore, but the baby's mother and the baby's slave. Always and always forever. She nourished it, but it gave nothing back. Nothing. It was separate from her. It lay sullen against her ribs, demanded more blood, more iron, more time, more space. And it took more space, pushing and scrambling about inside her. And she was powerless. It stretched, kicked now, some sort of beat its feet and its fists against her, it kept her awake at night, it swelled her breast, it wore her out. Not like that early serene doziness, but a grinding weariness in her legs, in her back, in her heart. Me, she wanted to shout, me, me, me. My baby, not theirs. My body, not its. It was stealing my life and I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I want it dead. But it was too late. She knew it was too late. They were bound together now for the duration, and there was no escape. One night, as the wicked queen was walking, she found a tiny baby, as beautiful as a princess and as small as your thumb, lying beside the pathway. She did not think, oh, this poor baby has got no mother. I must try and find her one. Oh, no. Mine, she thought to herself, mine. And she put the baby in her basket and carried it home. She dragged herself to the clinic. I'm too tired, she thought. I'm too tired. And my back aches and my ankles ache and I feel sick and it's too heavy. And I will tell the doctor, I will tell the doctor that I can't. That somebody else must. That I hate this baby. She could barely remember how the first richness had felt. She had felt it, and now she could not touch that feeling. It wasn't there. She had felt full of oil, and now she felt greasy. She had felt full of cream, and now she felt rancid. The midwives all smiled, not at the mothers, but at the lumps that stuck out of the front of the mothers. They looked chewy-eyed as well as bossy. Midwives love babies, but they're not too keen on mothers. <laughs> if she told them how she felt, they would be angry. They'd tell her not to be so selfish. They would tell her how many women longed to be where she was now. They would all be on the baby's side. It was her baby, hers. But no one believed that. She could not believe it herself. The baby was theirs because they loved it and she didn't. Why didn't they take care of it then and let her off, let her out? Let her go. If they wanted it, they could have it. And she could have her body, her space, her own life back. The wicked queen climbed the narrow stairs and took out her secret key and let herself into her secret chamber and unpacked her little basket and looked at the tiny princess. Mine, she thought to herself, mine. I will rub her with yeast and I will put her in the red bread oven and when she is grown, then if she is sweet, she will, if she is sweet, she will love me and if she is strong, she will serve me. So she rubbed the baby in yeast and put her in the red bread oven. 
I'm out of time, so I think I've got to stop there. And we will never know what happens. Yeah. 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 And of course, for all of you who groaned at not hearing the end of the story, all you have to do is buy it. <laughs>